prison away you yeah. go. No, I mean earlier. I've got doors to it. Okay. Yeah, just for today. Thanks, Steve. Good morning. Good morning. All right. You had must have had at least a cup of coffee before you came here. So. Two. Okay. <laughs> well, good morning to this uh, worship service here at First Congregational, and a good morning to all of our folks listening and watching on Facebook and Zoom this morning. Are there any announcements this morning, Blakely? Blakely's birthday, 10 days. Woo, 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 woo. Eight years old, Blakely. Oh, boy. February 5th is your birthday? Okay. Let, oh, that's good to know. Yeah. Oh, good. Doris. Thank you, Doris. Appreciate it. And to our members on Zoom, if you need eggs, come to the church. Come to the church. <laughs> Larry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Any other announcements? Dennis, good morning. Five o'clock start time. Five o'clock start time. Take note. Also, our Ash Wednesday service on that same night starts at 6.30, so please take note of that. Chris, good to see you this morning. Good to see you. Anybody else? Rod, if you were there on Zoom, good morning. Glad you could join us. And again, welcome to all who are with us this morning remotely. Let us pause right now and center ourselves for worship for just a moment in, in silent reflection. Thank you, and as you keep your heads bowed, let us pray even further. O oh God, who is greater than the most powerful forces in this world, enable us to be still and know that you are God. O oh Lord, you who answers out of the whirlwind of everyday life, breathe in us your Holy Spirit to strengthen, comfort, and guide us in the midst of the storms of life. O oh, still, small voice, speak to us this hour that we might become makers of your peace in our homes, in our communities, in our country, and in our world. 
We pray all this in the name of the one who calmed the raging sea. Amen. Would you please stand now as we begin our service and our call to worship. The buzz of the world interrupts our lives and fills our hearts. Call us into your way of life, O God. The complaints of others settle in our mind and cloud our vision. The cries of the poor, the oppressed, and the outcasts pierce our hearts. Guide us in your example of living for others, O God. Fill our hearts, fill our eyes, fill our ears with your love, O God. Let us, hands, lead into the world, O God. Let us worship you together, God. And God, today we are here, as we are every Sunday, sinful people. Hear now our confession of sins to you, God, because you call us, and we ignore your whisper, listening to the voices of this world. You call us. It's a different path, following our own devices. You call us to be your voice, hands and feet in, in this world, to proclaim your peace, your comfort, forgiveness, healing, and love. Forgive us. Amen. Now let's begin with our opening hymn. It is number 414, Incarnate God, Immortal Love. Incarnate God, immortal love, whom we that have not seen your face by faith and faith alone embrace, believing where we cannot prove. in the dust you gave us life we know not why you systems have their day they have their day and cease to be they are but fleeting certainty and you O Christ are more than they please be seated our scripture reading this morning will be read by Doris. She'll be speaking from Luke 5, verses 1 through 11. Thank you. 
for someone who um, has to go out on a boat when only when the conditions are that it is flat as glass on an inland or a great lake and gets motion sickness. Uh, I looked at that picture that you see on your screen and some of the memories came back with a little trepidation. Um, that's why I pretty much stick to canoes. But all jokes aside, the boat that you see on the screen is not only part of my sermon title, but it's a very powerful archaeological find. And I know folks uh, watching from home can't see this, but uh, on the screen here we have a first century fishing boat that archaeologists recovered many years ago from, uh, I believe, around uh, the Sea of Galilee. And it may, may represent the kind of boat that we heard about in our scripture passage this morning. I want you to take a good look at it. I know some of you are in the cheap seats, but look at it, take a good look at it, because that boat is yours. I'll talk about that more in a moment. This boat is ours. This boat is ours too. What I would like you to do right now is I want you to stop, try to calm your busy mind, and reflect for a moment on this. I want you to go back into your mind and try to recall the first time you understood the concept of what it means to be a disciple and what it entails. Maybe it was a conversation, it was an event, but it just came to you. Was it a thought that came in your mind in the silence of the night, or were you doing something? Were you talking? Did the words from someone or Bible words stay with you? Give it a shot. Think about it a minute. Remember that thought. If, you didn't, if I didn't jar it from you now, think about it when it comes. Just tuck it away for a moment because we're going to deal with it a little bit later on in the sermon. So a little revelation about mine. My moment of at least beginning to understand what discipleship must entail came during an event in 1975. The event was a very large banquet in a basketball arena at the home of what would become my future alma mater, Northern Michigan University. Northern was hosting a big, huge banquet for the community and all of the alums to celebrate their 75th anniversary. I was 15 years old at the time, and I was part of an army, and I do mean an army of servers that brought out into the arena these big, huge, metallic boxes containing trays and trays of food, containing the plates and the dessert. It was my very first job, and I know that because it shows up on my recent social security statement. <laughs> so that's where it started. So for what seemed like hours and hours, I placed before guests plates of food, listening to their requests, answering their questions, serving them food serving them food. Now for this young kid, the event got me thinking, at least on a rudimentary level, about the concept of serving others. And remember, I had had Sunday school, but to go through the motions and do it and serve someone, wait on somebody, it really crystallized at that moment for me what discipleship might look like at the young age of 15. Now again, Granted, serving food to people for a paycheck is not the finest example of discipleship, but the job began to help me connect the dots. Connect the dots. Being kind to people. Waiting on them. And what that felt like inside. And of course, this experience opened 
my mind and heart to receiving more such experiences later in life. Being around relatives who were silent examples of discipleship, who didn't talk much but did much, loved people, and most notably my elderly relatives, the senior citizens who are our neighbors across the street on College Avenue and Marquette. And what stood out for me was their kindness. Their actions said a lot. And these experiences of seeing them as examples of discipleship have stayed with me to this date, and I have tried to emulate them. Very important. They showed me what it meant about embodying what it means to be a disciple, and how that connects to Christ, which, of course, we see on display in Luke this morning. What Luke puts in front of us today, front and center, of course, is the fishing boat, where Jesus uses the boat to catch his first disciples so his ministry could start growing and prosper. We may not uh, know this, but up until this time, Jesus had largely been a solo act, he had been going out, preaching in the communities, visiting the synagogues, teaching wherever there was a crowd or wherever, wherever a crowd gathered. The first disciples that Jesus caught in the boat that day were very humble and simple people. They were from the lowest rungs of society. Fishermen. People who didn't go to the synagogue daily or study the law or the Torah or circulate in the high rungs of society. They were people outside the normal social and religious structures of the time. Poor, struggling day by day to put food on their table for their relatives, their families. Fishermen who were forced to give up the first part of their catch to the tax collectors and pay a fee that went to their vassal king and their brutal emperor of Rome. And what does Jesus do to find his first disciples? He goes to the margins of the margins to find people who will make a wonderful cadre of disciples. He goes to find people who make a living out of knowing where the fish congregate. Think about that for a moment. If you're coming to catch disciples and catch listeners, wouldn't you employ people that know where the fish are, where they gather. They knew where all the shoals were. They knew where all the reefs were. They knew. And so to find people that knew how to find the gatherings, that was pretty smart. And so he asks these first disciples to do something in public that is difficult to refuse. Take a risk. Have faith in me as a stranger who you just met here along the shoreline of Lake Galilee. Become part of something that you have never experienced in life and engage in a new vocation. I mean, think about that, going from fisherman to disciple, just like that. Amazing. So if we think about this scene in Luke and realize the words that Jesus spoke to the crowds that pressed him along the way against the lake that day that forced him to go out into the boat, a Christ that speaks about a new kingdom, a new way to live in an oppressive society of brutality and economic hardship for the poor, and to say that a new reign of justice had come. Wow. Those are mighty words and a mighty message that he gave. And after hearing those words, it might have been pretty easy for Simon Peter and James and John to say yes to dropping everything and following Jesus without, without the miracle that we heard about this morning, of course, with all the fish overwhelming the boats. So Christ this morning gets his first disciples, doesn't he? He gets his first disciples into the boat of his ministry. And in that moment, by the water, the disciples have their moment, which they begin to understand what discipleship is going to entail. All right. Think back now to that memory you recalled a few moments ago where you first understood what it meant to be a disciple, where you first understood your call, your experience 
of being nudged forward to catch people for Jesus, to help people. The moment in which you heard the Holy Spirit reaching out to you. I bet it feels pretty special, doesn't it? Holy. Amazing. And think about that moment that you just remembered. That's the moment that propelled you forward to learn more about God, Christ, and what it means to be a disciple and bring you to a place where you are at this morning, First Congregational Church. And from that moment, you learn to serve others inside and outside the walls of, these church, of this church and to be an embodiment of Jesus' heart and God's love and God's word. In that moment that you experienced, that moment, what happened was God cut through the noise, the disorder and the strife of this world and the monotony of your routines to draw you in to be a disciple. Here's something more worth mentioning. In that moment, Jesus picked you. Jesus picked you. Jesus picked us. We're in that boat of discipleship, just like the disciples were. We see ourselves in Simon, Peter, James, and John. Like them, we've fallen to our knees and question why Jesus chose imperfect people to help grow the kingdom of God on earth. Think especially of Peter when you think sometimes, ah, I'm not a worthy disciple. Here is Peter, who Jesus would say, I'm going to build my church on you. You're going to be the rock of my earthly church. The same Peter that would deny three times that he knew Jesus before Christ was killed on the cross. All of you, myself, are the ones that Jesus, the head of the church, chose to build this church here and elsewhere. Jesus chose us to continue the ministry that's been going strong in this building since 1876. And Jesus chose us to spread the word of God's children, us, and with a ministry and with teachings and scripture. Us as ordinary people, teachers, hobby farmers, business people, nurses, factory workers, people that care for those who are invalid, people who are in turn all called us to help people worse off than ourselves. That's something to celebrate. That's something to think about. All right, so now I say the obvious. Being in the net of discipleship and the boat of being a disciple is tough work. Sometimes we fall short, we become lax, we take a little vacation from always being on as disciples, don't we? Me too. We tire, especially in these times of a medical emergency, strife in government. We worry about our jobs, our families, and health, and wonder whatever happened to the good old days. Let's be honest today, and as we're gathered here together, as brothers and sisters in Christ, the cost of discipleship does exact a price, doesn't it? I think of a classic book of Christian thought that you may be familiar with, be familiar with called The Cost of Discipleship. It was authored by a German theologian and Lutheran pastor, Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And this book is basically an exposition about Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And in that book, Bonhoeffer spells out what he believes entails for a disciple to follow Christ. Bonhoeffer's book was first published in 1937 during the rise of Nazi Germany. And against this backdrop, Bonhoeffer developed a theology on the cost of discipleship, which, by the way, ultimately cost him his life at the hand of the Nazis. In his book, Bonhoeffer gave a powerful, awesome voice to the millions of Christians who believed personal sacrifice is an essential component of faith and discipleship. Bonhoeffer opposed from the start and criticized the German church for not opposing the Nazis, for staying silent. 
among the mighty words that Bonhoeffer said in his book. Discipleship can tolerate no conditions which might come between Jesus and our obedience to him. No conditions which might come between Jesus and our obedience to him. He said, we are disciples of Christ, or we are not Christians at all. And lastly, he said, we are not to simply bandage the wounds of victims beneath the wheels of injustice. We are to drive a spoke into the wheel itself. That last quote from Bonhoeffer's work, all of his words were written in prison and before he was hanged. But his words point to how we are called by Christ to stand out by acting and speaking out against the injustices of this world, just like Jesus did. And we are called to put his teachings in place. And we are challenged to respond to the urgings of God breaking into our lives and urging us to go to places where we may not want to go. Theologian Henry Nouwen, one of my favorites, reminds us that being a disciple entails becoming servant leaders. Servant leaders who must have the willingness to be led to the unknown, undesirable, painful places and help the least among us. It's not about leadership and power and control, no one said, but a leadership of powerlessness and humility which the suffering servant of God, Jesus Christ, is made manifest in our work. The cross is Jesus's, but we must be carrying it as disciples. It's a cross with burdens, but carrying that cross comes with great, awesome, wonderful rewards. We are in that boat with the disciples. Work that involves sacrifice and a radical reorientation of priorities and commitment. I know this seems all elementary, but I think it, it is worth mentioning again that it is tough work being a disciple. Christ called the first three disciples from that boat, as he does us, to be in the shadow of the cross and follow him in daily living and amidst the struggles and challenges us, and the challenges rather, and to endure hardship and even ridicule and sometimes go against the prevailing thought and views of people around us to help the least around us. Today, Luke gives us a wonderful, powerful reminder of the birth of discipleship and a testimony of sacrifice that we carry. Sacrifice by the original disciples and us as ever-evolving disciples. So today, let's use what we heard in Luke today to recharge our batteries, to go forward once again and do the work that God has asked us to do, and to rejoice again that God picked us. God picked us to serve. God freed us from our nets of the past so that we could be part of God's plan to carry the kingdom far and wide. Let's also recognize that discipleship is always going to be a process and that there was still more learning, myself included. We need to continue further submersing ourselves in the wonder and the love for Christ that lives within all of us. So today, let us resolve to keep our hearts and mind open even more. Remember to take quiet times each day to be open to the Holy Spirit and where Jesus calls us to go next in service to God. Don't just wait for Lent, but take time to sit each day and be inward and be in conversation with the Holy Spirit. And during your normal days, and this can be easy to do, I don't care if you're retired or not or very busy, but during the day, pay attention to your thoughts and your feelings. What are they saying to you as a disciple of Christ? What part of the boat 
is the Holy Spirit asking you to stand when you're in conversation with the Holy Spirit? Is it part of the boat demanding you to speak out against something going on in your community that goes against the teachings of Christ? Or is it part of the boat of discipleship calling you to testify to someone who is not a Christian about God's immense love for us and how, how we are all part of one human family despite our differences of politics, race, color, or sexual orientation? Let us keep listening, and let us keep doing the work of Christ. Let us keep speaking about our faith to others, so others can know and experience what we already know. And that is, we are called to be the embodiment of Christ's heart, and have a heart like Christ in our words and in our actions. Lastly, celebrate today. Celebrate your day. Give yourself a pat on the back, what you have done, and how you have all become role models and wonderful living examples of a disciple over many years, spoken out by your grandchildren that see you in action, your friends. You are role models. Celebrate that. You have brought the Holy Spirit in the midst of people with your discipleship. God saw potential in you, in me, in everyone to be a disciple. So let that be a message that we share with others around us so we too can bring them into the nets from the boat of discipleship. And finally, perhaps someone is now in our midst that is not yet a Christian, doesn't know much about faith or that white church on the corner of 5th and Bancroft Street, but perhaps that person now in our midst will remember into the future after we are gone from this life that it was you who led them to that boat of discipleship for Christ by your example of words in life itself in cooperation with the Holy Spirit. It was you who showed them what it meant to be a servant of others by your love, patience, kindness, and compassion. That is what today is about, renewing our commitment as disciples of Christ and being open to going down new roads for Christ and all the while knowing that the shadow, the shadow of love and protection of Christ follows us everywhere we go on that boat. Amen. Amen, Brother Glenn. So, to end this sermon, and to go, before we go into our prayer, I'd like to invite a few voices up front now. Jan and Lou and Steve and Barb, come on up here. So many years ago, there were people that saw Jesus, and there were people that were obviously very affected by what Jesus said and did. of the called. Come follow me, he said as he walked towards us. Leave the nets behind. Become nets yourself. We have an adventure to be part of. And so we left with him, not knowing what we had in front of us. In front of me was a crowd of Pharisees, all of them hypocrites. 
They knew what I had done and done it mainly with them, yet they were ready to stone me for it. Jesus called out, let him who is without sin cast the first stone. And there was silence. And one by one, they left me with him who called me to go and find my humanity again. And so I went more alive than ever before. She was more alive than ever before. My daughter. After hearing Jesus speak in the town, she said Jesus spoke about how we as people with little money would be blessed. We as people who are poor in spirit will be blessed. Jesus said, all are loved in God's kingdom. My heart soared when my daughter said those words to me from Jesus. I was called back to life. I was once dead. Not, not the death of eternity. Um, it was worse than that. It was the death of the living. Uh, I'm a tax collector. My death was the silence, the hatred of others. Until one day, I climbed a tree. And I was invited back into my own home by Jesus for a meal. And through that, I was reborn. I'm now a new person, now called to be a friend of God. I'm on my way. We were on our way, ten of us, unclean with bandaged limbs and dirty rags covering our hands and our feet that lepros leprosy had left, leprosy was eating away. Everyone avoided us except Jesus, who touched us, befriended us, and called us back into the community, clean once more and acceptable. I ran back to Jesus just to thank him, it was all I could do. <coughs> it was all I could do to say yes, yes to God, asking me to be the mother of a child who would be the salvation of the world, who harbored hope enough to bring down the oppressor and lift up the poor and hungry. I was called to be the mother of God and I said, yes. I said, yes. But it wasn't just some biblical story. It was now. I said, yes, to God's justice today. God's hope now. God's intent in me to call out the life in me and set it free in the world to be a follower of adventures, a follower of dreams, a follower of love. Be a follower of love and join the fishermen, the sinners, the women, and the children, the sick and the poor, the needy and the hopeful, called to be fully alive in this world, called to be the hands and the feet of heaven, called to be all that we can be. We are called to follow. applicable not only to today, but for always. Let us now bow our heads in prayer.
Dear God, we are gathered this morning to remember once again the cost of discipleship. We are overjoyed that you have chosen us to further the word in the kingdom, your kingdom. We ask you and Jesus Christ to continue to embolden us and inspire us and lead us as we do your work in the trenches. In the trenches of strife, the pandemic, and the challenges and the wars of this world. God, we gather this morning to recognize people in our midst who are suffering, suffering the loss of something. Be with those and comfort those and also our relatives and our friends and people we don't know in the community that are in the same boat as we are. We ask you to bless the peacemakers and to bring peace to our country and to the world so we will not be divided but united in the work that we know still needs to be done to realize the vision of your kingdom, which is always evolving. Lord, we appreciate all the work that our people on the front line are doing to protect us and help us, care for us, the first responders, the doctors, the bed cleaners, whoever they are, we praise their work. And Lord, we also praise the men and women in our military who are protecting us. And we also, at this time now, pause, Lord, in a moment of silence to give you our own prayers and petitions, either silently or out loud. Lord, as you hear our prayers, hear now this prayer that we will now say to you out loud and together, the prayer that your son taught us. We say together, Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. For the offerings that we have received today as disciples of Jesus Christ, let us understand the cost of discipleship, that with these tithes and offerings, the cost will be easy to bear in terms of our time and talents, but it will help us to do the work we are called to do as disciples of Christ. Would you please rise? Rise now for our closing hymn. It is number 172. Jesus calls us for the tumult. Jesus calls us for the tumult of our day. By day that voice still calls us, saying, Christian, 
follow me. Oh, Saint Andrew Hearn. <clears throat> Calls us to the worship of the treasures we adore from each idol you have made me christian love me love me more Friends, hear now this benediction as you go out and serve Jesus Christ. We are in that same boat as the disciples. Let us bring more into that boat of discipleship so that we may love and serve our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ even more now and forever. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen. <laughs>